pleasure to be here. Um, it's certainly warmer than I expected it to be. <laughs> I spent six years living in Florida and I still haven't adjusted to Washington, D.C. So um, I was kind of dreading this, but it's not that bad. So. <laughs> I've also just learned that um, I'm a fellow cardinal with you, so our mascot at Catholic University is also the cardinal. And I didn't realize that your Cardinal Virtue series is, is picking up on that, which is wonderful. So it's just a pleasure to be here on this Feast of Our Lady. Um, I have known your president, your new president, just for a brief time, but I count him among those whom, as St. John Chrysostom put it, one looks forward to being with not only in this life, but forever in the next. So I have an admission to make, which is that when I was asked to join this lecture series or to, to participate in this lecture series on the Cardinal Virtues, I hoped very much that I would not be asked to speak about justice. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the study of which, as a principle of social order, and even as a virtue, leaves even the most diligent students uh, weak need, actually. Treatises on justice are not in short supply, and most of them are not short. <laughs> so, with thanks to President Burns for this assignment, I will endeavor to make some remarks about justice, and in particular about economic justice. And I will be, therefore, uh, speaking about economic justice, Focusing on the conditions under which we might understand or believe or judge a social order to be just or righteous in relation to economic life. And so I will not be focusing particularly on justice as the individual virtue. But I will say in advance that it is surely a task of the just man to will the just society. Therefore, the just man should not be indifferent to various social configurations. This means that the understanding of the just society is not oblique to the pursuit and the practice of justice as an individual virtue. For instance, I take it for granted that an ardent socialist, a man who earnestly wills that private property be abolished, must necessarily fall short of excellence and justice, whatever the quality of his personal dealings with others. Just as an example. So the notion of economic justice seems to frustrate on all sides of the intellectual debate another reason for, for being a little bit weak need when thinking about economic justice. Contemporary political liberals favor structural notions of economic justice in which principles of fairness and equality find institutional expressions in public policy. At the same time, these various liberal thinkers struggle to offer a definition which can bound public policy in meaningful senses. Therefore, these types of policies tend to fall prey to accusations of socialist types of justice. Conservatives, for their part, mostly engage the notion of economic justice with much less vigor, preferring instead something like Hayekian or classical liberal rules-based conceptions of economic justice, or perhaps without admitting it, in fact, Nozickian conceptions of justice, which is something like the aggregate sorry, the aggregative sum of justly titled individual transactions, right? So we can reduce justice to just, you know, every transaction is just, we're all set, we're good. Wipe your hands and go home. <laughs> Ironically, and if not tragically, because there's not anything in the toolkit of the contemporary economist, my training, for instance, which is of any real use to considerations about justice, and permit me the dig, unless one wants to divide a numerator by a denominator, and more on this later, <laughs> These formidable thinkers, the economists, have mostly receded from the serious task of reflection on the nature of a free society and on the conditions under which men may be said to thrive, the latter of which I take to be the aim of economic justice, if one may be found. So what I would like to do this afternoon is proceed in a kind of programmatic way, offering an impressionistic account of certain features of economic life, together with some suggestions about what form a successful theory of economic justice might take. So, with that in mind, progress, uh, I said impressionistic. I, you have with you, I hope, uh, a handout with some of the longer quotes. So instead of putting them on slides, I thought I would give them to you in hand. And so I have some to read. So you will have patience with me then if I start in a place perhaps where you did not expect me to start. With the following literary account of a battle told from the perspective of a private infantryman. And now I'm going to read from the first quote, number one. Officers were running around, waving their swords and hollering, form. They yelled at us, form, form for attack. But nobody paid them much mind. 
We were too busy rummaging the tents. So they began to lay about us with the flats of their swords, driving us away from the plunder. It didn't take long. When we formed in line again, reloading our guns, squads and companies mixed every which way. They led us through the row of tents at a run. All around me, men were tripping on the ropes and cussing and barking their, their shins on the stakes. Then we got through and I saw why the officers had been yelling for us to form. There was a gang of federal soldiers standing shoulder to shoulder in the field beyond the tents. I thought it was a whole Yankee army lined up waiting for us. Those in front were kneeling under the guns of the men in the second line, a great bank of blue uniforms and rifle barrels and white faces like rows of eggs, one above another. When they fired, the smoke came at us in a solid wall. Things plucked at my clothes and twitched my hat. And when I looked around, I saw men all over the ground in the same ugly positions as the men on the slope, moaning and whimpering, clawing at the grass. I was what you might call unnerved, for they warn you there's going to be bleeding in battle, but you don't believe it until you see the blood. What happened from then on was all mixed up in the smoke. We formed again and went back through the tents, but the same thing happened. They were there just as before, and when they threw that wall of smoke and humming bullets at us, we came running back down the slope. Three times we went through, and it was the same every time. Finally, a fresh brigade came up from reserve, and we went through together. So this is a passage from the story of the Battle of Shiloh, told by the great Civil War historian Shelby Foote. The young private goes on to recount in this particular uh, chapter, he goes on to recount his confrontation with a big yank, wearing his coat unbuttoned halfway, showing a red flannel undershirt. The private wonders, in the midst of this smoke and firing, he wonders, what sort of man wears a red flannel undershirt? In the chaos of the engagement, he kills the big yank his bayonet somehow finding its way up under the chin of the large man. The private reflected on the closeness of the encounter, a moment experiencing the other, where he first sees this man for the first time in his life and extinguishes him in the same moment. At the very same instant, the private says, he had eyebrows drawn in a straight line, like black bar over his eyes. He was full grown with a wide brown mustache. I could see the individual hairs on each side of the shaved line down the middle of his eyebrows. I'd have to say sir to him back home. It's very poignant, right? He's discovering this person in the midst of killing him and realizing that at home it would all be different, right? Of the 425 men of the 6th Mississippi who engaged in that hour in Shiloh, only about 100 emerged. It's an amazing catastrophe. So. One of my messages tonight is that rival theories about economic life seem to be predicated upon competing views of whether the salient fact about human cooperation with nature is abundance or scarcity. So surely in battle, the salient reality is scarcity. So for any engagement between forces, think about say 20,000 men engaging each other and say 12,000 of them will perish. There are exactly 8,000 shares of human life to be had at the end of it all. And so 20,000 will go at it fighting for their portion of a given pie, right? a given pie of unknown size. Roughly 160,000 men engaged over three days in Gettysburg, most of you probably know, with 51,000 casualties recorded at the end, and this includes not only deaths, but also um, wounded and missing and captured. Initially, we might say, thinking about this kind of scarcity, that no one emerges with more than his fair share. Right? So it was your fair share to emerge alive, I think. Right? No one emerges with more than your fair share, but many emerge with less. But how quickly it might be said upon reflection that he who emerges with four limbs has more than his fair share, if contrasted with him who has three. The scale of fair fairness in scarcity shifts from an objective baseline to one of relative deprivation. He was deprived of little, lives like a prince in contrast with the double amputees and the blind. Yet all who live at all emerge with an equal share of something infinitely objectively valuable. So here, the second quote on your sheet is a quote from Heraclitus. War is the father and the king of all. War has made some gods and some men, some slaves and some free. So that seems like a good way to think about that. 
There's something deep and nearly incomprehensible in this fact about the outcome of war. And if we are still ready, as I said at the beginning, to divide numerators by denominators in the pursuit of justice, let us ponder one more. 110,000 men engaged in the Battle of Shiloh with the young private I've just been sharing with you, and 24,000 casualties were recorded. Thus, 86,000, or 78% of the men at Shiloh, won their fair share, emerging unscathed. Slightly better odds than at Gettysburg, where only 68% got a piece of the pie. So, this is scarcity of war. I'm gonna call this the scarcity of war. So, I wanna think about the dynamism of war for a moment. So this is something that's, I think, beautifully, if also painfully, brought out in Foote's description of the battle. The engagement of the battle, we can sensibly say something like the battle, right? Shiloh was the battle, one battle, one engagement. What is it? What is the description of this battle? It's a kind of dynamic shifting whole. It constitutes a specific engagement at a point in time. But it's composed of thousands of freely chosen interactions within it, each purposeful, right? and these are horrible purpose, purposes to have, right? Uh, but unguided in a kind of dramatic way. So the balance of these transactions, these exchanges, determines the victor. Importantly, in the midst of the battle itself, it is usually not clear what is taking place. Until the end, each soldier, we hope, presses on, retreats, thrusts, fires, crouches, runs, creeps, weeps, hollers, with no real sense of whether he is victor or loser. Virtue in battle, we understand, requires that he fight as if the entire battle depends upon him, and yet may be won by his own courageous action. There is also the fact that this, of this kind of quasi-directedness of battle which is interesting. The captain's attempt, we're, we're told, to channel the forces of action. Sixth Mississippi, stop plundering the tents, pull yourselves back together, charge up the slope. Our private tells us that three times they, were, they had to be called out to form and to charge, only to return back to the tents. Right? If you've studied up on the Civil War history, why do they go back to the tents? They're all starving, essentially. Right? They're looking for anything that they can eat. It's, just, it's, just, it's desperate. So the private describes what I would think of as a kind of dynamic reciprocal exchange between form and unform. And the unform is the result of individual incentives lining up in the same direction. Retreat and plunder basically seems like a more appealing option to every soldier than taking the slope. But the captains keep pressing with the flats of the sword. Right? Form, against individual incentives, aiming to configure things so that new sets of incentives might govern the dynamic chaos. When the fresh brigade appears, finally, with weariness setting in, the soldiers finally make the charge complete. Though it ends in defeat for them at Shiloh, the end of the battle for the living is anyway counted as an individual victory. We'd aged a lifetime since the sun came up, the private said. Captain Plummer was calling us to rally, rally here, but there wasn't much rally left in us. There wasn't much left in me, anyhow. So I want to think about three types of dynamisms. I know that, um, it's getting out of control. The title of my talk was Justice and Dynamism, but I'm going to identify three kinds of dynamisms. <clears throat> So the sun, <clears throat> excuse me, the sun set that day on the men at Shiloh. But Shiloh took place over two days, April 6th and 7th. And so the horrors that were just described were repeated the next day, wave upon wave of engagements. Right? So I want you to start thinking about motion. If you're already thinking about war, think about motion. Men entering and leaving battle, dead and wounded, fresh and increasingly younger and older. This is a tragedy of the Civil War that people forget. Over the course of the war, as you get to the later and later years, younger and older soldiers are brought in. And the younger ones, uh, before very long, are the age of my boys, so I can't even read about the Civil War without um, more or less losing my, losing my cool. If I get through the next few pages without breaking down, congratulate me. Uh, so, so let's think about this younger and older arms for battle going in. The Civil War constituted, and it's whole, right? It's a massive war. It constituted a seemingly endless stream of battles, characterized by what I call these three dynamisms. First, that there is a war at all. And in this phrase, I want to use war with a capital W, that there is a, a war that we call, we call the war at all. 
that there is a place where men meet each other in pastures to make a gamble for shares of the reaper's pie. Never mind now whether that fact is desirable. I merely want to register how unusual it is in all of nature that there are fields and creeks and forests and valleys where animals on two feet hurl upon each other in massive engagements, after which pastures are irrigated with an unholy water. On the, on the whole, we can think about the war as a canvas kind of backdrop, which need not exist. Indeed, it normally does not exist. This is a dynamism we can think of as the coming in and out of existence, right? And it should not be entirely neglected. So wars are not inevitable. The second dynamism is what we've just considered. This furious, chaotic, directed, undirected, formed, unformed mess, if you will, of individual actions, each of which has some probability of rendering what? Damage to the opponent the sum of which constitutes an engagement, or what we would call a battle. We have the war and we have battles, a battle. Each battle has its own dynamic, its own destruction, its own lessons. And each battle constitutes a part of the war, right? But it has its own kind of life, its own logic. Each battle is as complex as the war itself, right? In its own way, each battle offers up a kind of infinitude of human experience and loss. So I, I, I pulled another small quote. This is quote number three for you from the same private. And I want you to think about this, all of what we're just seeing in the one private and his one experience on one day. So think about that multiplied by the 100,000 troops that engage in Shiloh. So one battle, this is an infinitude of human experience and loss. We'd aged a lifetime since the sun came up, he said. Joe Marsh was next to me. At first I didn't know him. He didn't seem bad hurt but he had a terrible look around the eyes and there was a knot on his forehead the size of a walnut where some yank had bopped him with a rifle butt. I thought to ask him how the Tennessee breed of elephant compared with the Kentucky breed, but I didn't. He had lorded it over me for a month about being greenhorn. Yet here I was, just gone through meeting as big an elephant as any he had met, and he was still trying the same high and mightiness. He was mad now because he wasn't the only one who'd seen some battle. He'd had this big secret to throw up to us, but not anymore. We all had it now, right? Really very human. It's just, right, the interactions of one and another soldier. We might usefully, I think, thank you. Thank you very much. I'll put it here. This is great, thank you. We might usefully borrow the language of irreducible complexity when we consider the, the single engagement Irreducible because a single transaction between two soldiers, enemy soldiers, cannot possibly for, perform the function of the battle at large. Uh, complex, so irreducible complexity is complex because these transactions, each of them are kind of stuffed up with human reality. No other act of destruction in the war, right? Like, if, we, if we picked a good illustration here, and we've just thought about one battle and we think about extending that throughout the whole civil war, no other act of destruction in, in, among the millions which will take place will have just the character of the one we just described, just that one, just their character. I'd have to say sir to him at home. That thought and that character. So that's, uh, that's infinitely complex and you multiply that. So this is very, very interesting. Finally, uh, so we're, now we're onto the third kind of, so that was, what takes place in that single battle is another kind of dynamism. And so finally, the third dynamism, and I want you to think about this. It is a poignant and sad fact that according to the records, exactly, we counted, exactly 52 battles, including major and minor engagements, preceded Shiloh, which was also called Pittsburgh Landing. Uh, and this took place in April of 1862. Shiloh predated Gettysburg by 15 months. And 331 battles took place after Shiloh. A massive number of battles, right? And every one of them, you have you know, uh, thousands and thousands of casualties. So the third dynamism refers to this feature, that this irreducibly these irreducibly complex engagements, what we call the battle, are repeated right, over and over. Same, but different, right? Everyone's different, but they're all sort of the same. They're layered on top of each other. 
Sometimes they take place at the same time. Sometimes they're interdependent. Shiloh was fought in Tennessee, but it takes place at the very same time as the Siege of Yorktown, which is much longer and less decisive battle. So to comprehend the war at large is to grasp these three different dynamisms at the same time. With clarity, the motion or change involved in coming into existence, the motion or the actions of what I'm calling reduction, that every, every characteristic action of war is a reduction of goodness of human life. This is subtraction, right? In each engagement, and then finally the motion of repetition, which you know we might, with some loss of accuracy, some, we might compare the war to a stream, right? A stream of battles, so it's a stream of battles. It has a beginning where it leaves its mouth, and along the way, it's characterized by kind of cross sections, which are dynamic, right? Dynamic, mo like moment in the stream. And then we think about the downward motion of the flow of the stream, the movement from one cross section to the next. So notice that a motion of a body of water is called a current. And a current is a measure of a movement in relation to time. Of the war at large, Heraclitus again seems relevant. Um, so this is probably the most cited Heraclitus that we could think of, of those who entered the same rivers, ever different waters flow, right? You can't step into the same river twice, is usually how it's rendered, although my, my Greek translating husband says this is a better translation. <laughs> so you have the best translation in front of you. <laughs> to introduce the three dynamisms then is to aim at incorporating time. That's what this, what this focus on dynamism is. Um, incorporating time is a critical factor in the account of things. It may or may not be that we gain very much from this perspective on the Civil War, reflection upon which is always edifying. But if I have done my work well up till now, you will have anticipated my next move. Where I think we may gain, and in fact where we must gain, is through embracing the analogous but contrary relation between war and market. In fact, I have not been speaking about war from the beginning, but rather about what is something like the negative mirror image of the market. If the salient fact and dynamism of the former, of war, is scarcity, transacted with what I'm calling the currency of depletion, every transaction war negates, destroys, eliminates, reduces, then the salient fact and dynamism of the latter is abundance or increase, transacted with the currency of enlargement. It follows that any serious account of economic justice must deal with the features of this kind of dynamism as replete with the tendency to enlarge as war is replete with reduction. Of course, there are rudimentary notions of economic justice which make no attempt to think about markets at all or economic life proper, and which do, again, aim merely to divide numerators, invariably measures of output or product, by denominators, invariably numbers of souls, calling for increasingly sophisticated measures of how much product is available, in theory, to distribute to each person. But I take it for granted that these efforts, which nonetheless occupy the attention of a small army of economists, have very little whatsoever to do with economic justice, at least nothing more than an accounting of the dead bodies and the severed limbs divided by the number of forces has to do with the justice of the war, or even with the justice of a particular engagement. It's like, it's like the wrong measure altogether. It's like the barking up the wrong tree. Okay, so what about this abundance, this abundance of exchange? So the move from the transactions of war to transactions of exchange seems roughly accessible, so long as we are willing to grant that the full measure of destruction in any act of war cannot be ascertained by surveying the physical losses alone. So take, for instance, the loss of limb, which was so common in the Civil War. The missing piece of flesh might be observed and counted, but the true value of the loss of limb has profound magnitude, right? Including beyond the physical, emotional, relational, economic effects for the sufferer of this loss. And these effects actually, when we think about it, they extend over time too, don't they? They are likely to ripple through children and grandchildren of the amputee, children of World War II veterans, Korean War vets, of Vietnam War vets, of Gulf War vets know this very well. Similarly, in economic exchange, we miss most of the action 
If we examine or count only the physical transaction itself, the goods exchanged and the services rendered, every exchange produces a seen and an unseen sum of value. And like the case of the lost limb, what is unseen is subjectively tied to the person. Right? How many children will, su will suffer the, the consequences of a father without a leg? Right? And you think so it's, it's going to be different for every particular person. To see this more carefully, I have a quote from Friedrich Hayek, which is also on your handout. And, and forgive me, I'm not going to be able to go through the whole uh, the, the theory of, of productive exchange, but uh, I'll take for granted you have a little familiarity with that. An increase in value, Hayek says, crucial in exchange and trade, is indeed different from increases in quantity observable by our senses. Increase in value, which is subjective, is something for which laws governing physical events, at least as it is understood within materialistic and mechanistic models, do not account. What does he mean by that? You know, something like the, um, the laws which say that matter is not created or destroyed, right? I grew up as a science major, and it took me a couple of years to really believe that value could be created. <laughs> it's consistent, it can't be created. Um, value includes, uh, sorry, value indicates the potential capacities of an object to satisfy human needs and can be ascertained only by the mutual adjustment through exchange of respective rates of substitution, which different goods and services have for various individuals. Value is not an attribute, right, or a physical property possessed by things themselves, irrespective of their relations to men, right? That glass of water, as they say, is worth a lot more to me now, since I'm giving you a speaking, than it would, be, would have been even to me one hour ago when I was not thirsty. So it's not an attribute or physical property possessed by the things themselves, but only in relation to men, in relation to men and solely um, an aspect of these relations that enables men to take an account in their decisions about the use of such things, of the better opportunities others might have for their use, Increase in value, he says, appears only with, and is relevant only with regard to, human purposes. Hayek continues in the same essay, and that's just the very next quote. Indeed, a certain sense, in a certain sense, the activity that economists set out to explain is not about physical phenomena, but about people. Economic values are interpretations of physical facts in the light of the degrees of suitability of kinds of physical objects in particular situations for the satisfaction of needs. All of this falls under the heading of the theory of subjective value. Not only does market exchange tend to increase value, the estimation or accounting of that value, that increase, that abundance, cannot be approached through any ordinary mathematical sum. There's no way to add it up. It is what I would call inestimable, not in the sense of having infinite value, but in the sense of simply being unknowable. A corollary of this is that dollar amounts, which represent a fixed basket of goods, for instance, or multiples of fixed basket of goods, do not have the same value to all members of the economy, difficult as this is to believe. And I have one more, Heraclitus, for you. All things are in exchange for fire, and fire for all things, even as wares for gold and gold for wares, right? This, uh, what we want to say here is, as curious as it sounds, especially within our, our Catholic tradition, the only things which have a fixed objective value in the sense that we usually mean it are those things which are properly, in fact, supernatural in character. So people right, have objective value, ourselves and others, grace, eternal life. But all the material objects we can think of are shown to have subjective and therefore relative value. It's a kind of intriguing proof of what we could think of as the super reality of the supernatural. It seems to us as embodied creatures that what is more real is what is more tangible. But Teresa of Avila used to say that she had had the grace of being able to see the tangible world as kind of thin and not so real as the next life. I mean, St. Paul said this too, right? But St. Teresa of Avila said this. Uh, the subjective theory of value kind of points in this direction, as odd as it is, right? On this, Hayek mused, and this is the next quote on your page, that the hierarchy of ends, right, the final, the final ends of things, the philosophical ends, the things which have true objective value, is relatively stable, right? It's not like persons are you know, more valuable today than they were 10 years ago or 100 years ago. They remain fixed. 
Whereas the hierarchy of means, how we achieve our ends, does in fact fluctuate. It fluctuates so much that it leads many idealistic persons, Hayek thinks, to prize the former and disdain the latter. So idealistic persons might disdain economics or business or the means by which we support ourselves. Because to serve a constantly changing scale of values, he says, may seem repulsive. I think he's quite right about this. In any event, the tendency of economic exchange to increase value is consistently missed by the accountant's ledger. It is not that physical growth, right, or growth in the economic uh, attributes cannot be observed. In fact, we see it. But that the physical record of enlargement is actually a shadow of the more real, immaterial increase in value that takes place through free and voluntary exchange. In contrast with war as an engine of scarcity, markets are a kind of harvest of abundance. And there's some conditions for this, right? But this is a basic fact. So since I was anyway, and perhaps very obviously, I don't know how it seemed to you, talking about markets when I was talking about war, there is no need to really belabor the analogies to economic life. But as I promised a sort of impressionistic account, I do want to offer one more literary frame of reference. And this one from Oliver Twist. The iconic market morning scene, which in any case proves that I do not wish to romanticize about markets. That markets tend to be an engine of abundance does not imply that they tend in every case to be beautiful. Miraculous, perhaps, but aesthetically pleasing, not always. So from Oliver Twist, it was market morning. The ground was covered nearly ankle deep with filth and mire. A thick stream perpetually rising from the reeking bodies of the cattle and mingling with the fog which seemed to rest upon the chimney tops hung heavily above. All the pens in the center of the large area and as many temporary pens as could be crowded into the vacant space were filled with sheep. Tied up to posts by the gutter side were long lines of beasts and oxen, three or four deep. Countrymen, butchers, drovers, hawkers, boys, thieves, idlers, vagabonds of every low grade, they were mingled together in a mass. The whistling of drovers, the barking of dogs, the bellowing and plunging of oxen, the bleeding of sheep, the grunting and squeaking of pigs, the cries of the hawkers, the shouts, oaths, quarreling on all sides, the ringing of bells, the roar of voices that issued from every public house, the crowding, the pushing, the driving, the beating, the whooping, the yelling, the hideous and discordant din that resounded from every corner of the market and the unwashed, unshaven, squalid, and dirty figures constantly running to and fro, bursting in and out of the throng, rendered it a stunning and bewildering scene, which quite confounded the senses. I didn't want to go back to Shelby Foote, but when I was thinking about this description of the market, and this is Oliver's first view of what a market looked like in London, I couldn't resist the comparison, all of the, the, the descriptions of the sounds, you know, Actually, there, you know, every other page in the Battle of Shiloh sounds like this. So I quote number 10, we're going to go back to Shiloh for a moment. And the private says that when he stopped in the middle, it's like the first time he's been shot at his whole life, right? And he says, when I stopped, I began to hear all sorts of things I hadn't heard while I was running. It was like being born again. And actually, this is kind of Oliver's view. Like, this is a completely different world, what I've just seen. It was like being born again, coming into a new world. There was such a great clash and clatter of firing. Over all this, I could hear them all around me, screaming and yelping like, a, like on a fox hunt, except there was something crazy mixed up in it too, like horses trapped in a burning barn. I thought, they all gone crazy. They looked it for a fact. Their faces were split wide open with screaming, mouths twisted on every which way, and this wild lunatic yelping coming out. It was like they were yelling with their mouths. It was more like the yelling with something pent up inside them, and they were opening their mouths just to let it out. That was the first time I really knew how scared I was. So, so actually, Oliver Twist is completely overwhelmed. This private, it's, this, it's the overwhelmingness of the sounds and what he's seeing is completely overwhelmed. It will not be lost in you that I have chosen two scenes from the 19th century, although one, one written contemporaneously. One fact of contemporary life is that many of the most important human events are now quite sanitized, sort of bleached of color, if you will. Money changing today, for instance, is far less dramatic than it used to be, and wars are not fought in the same manner as the one we call civil, although the logic of scarcity is no less accurate, and markets are typically less overwhelming than what Oliver Twist focused, if, uh, faced, although these features do still remain in some areas. Uh, cattle markets are pretty exciting, 
uh, places. Most of us don't go to them, but you can go see them. There are lots of great ones. Um, the challenge for us, right, is to see the billions of digital transactions, malls and coffee shops, auto repair shops, junkyards, business enterprises of all form and function as the great grandchildren of the London marketplaces described by Dickens. In these places, yes, vagabonds of every low grade are still mingled with those of nobler purpose. And if we could see and hear and smell every part of the market today, we would surely be as stunned and bewildered as Oliver. Like the battles we imagined before, the marketplace is a dynamic shifting whole composed of hundreds of freely chosen interactions, each purposeful but unguided. And when we add to these images, um, in addition to the naked marketplace just described, what we would think of as economic activity inside of business enterprise firms, right? we start to see the contours of that kind of formed, unformed thing that was happening on the battlefield. Form, a manager might call. But nonetheless, outcomes and value are in every case the result of compounded effects of uncountable numbers of richly layered human interactions. Human interactions, each of them as important as, at home I would have called him sir. Right? How many times in the contemporary marketplace is that same courtesy, sir or ma'am, extended beyond the ordinary expectations of age and station? So see here how what war takes away the market adds. So the three dynamisms of economic life correspond first to the existence of the market right, at large. The market is not inevitable. Second, to formed and unformed engagements, specific markets of various sizes and qualities. And third, to the waves of repeated, overlapping, interdependent markets which flow in time forward. Hayek puts it this way, and this is also on your sheet, in order to explain the economic aspects of large social systems, we have to account for the course of a flowing stream, constantly adapting itself as a whole to changes in circumstances of which each participant, right, this is like the guy in battle, no idea whether things are winning or losing, but each participant can only know a small fraction. Right? And not for a hypothetical state of equilibrium determined by a set of ascertainable data. So in that last line, Hayek is picking on professional economists, and uh, that has its place. Okay, so critically, every instant in time, every instant in time, we're thinking about currency and currents and streams and rivers flowing. Every instant in time is dependent, those markets and those repeated interactions dependent upon contemporaneous actions like the other battles taking place at the same time and past decisions now realized. At every instant, Every instant is, in a sense, already passed, and the moment has been lived, right? This is just a straight philosophical and maybe depressing reflection on time. <laughs> it's already, like, there's no present, it's already gone, right? This pressing forward motion is what prompts Hayek to warn in remarking upon John Stuart Mill's constructivist approach to the distribution of goods. And this is on your page, quote 12, it is simply wrong to conclude that the things once there, your iPhones, your artisan coffees, that we are free to do with them as we like, for they will not be there unless individuals have generated price information by securing for themselves shares of the total. This is part of a larger argument that Hayek makes. Um, but this argument that he makes hinges upon the logic of repeated, essentially repeated games, repeated dynamic game theory. Okay. So these remarks, I hope, or think, provide a little bit of a springboard for finally um, getting to considerations of economic justice, which are motivated by this conception of economic life as a kind of dynamic abundance. So I'm not gonna get all the way there, you were like, no, I'm gonna finish my talk, but I'm not gonna get all the way to a full, right? This is, we're gonna just get started uh, thinking about what economic justice might look like. But we could begin to say right off the bat that the first principle of economic justice is surely to preserve the integrity of the market as a whole. With a view to the three dynamisms, importantly, this, pr this principle does not arise from a theory of individual rights, right? We're not thinking about, well, the market has to be there because individuals have a right to do their stuff, right? And not even from a priority of rules over outcomes, like something that what Hayek would prefer, although we could incorporate these later. Rather, the principle begins from the presupposition that the harvest of abundance is a great human good, like life itself, 
a good upon which many other goods depend. So the principle is augmented by the facts of dynamism. If the market is not inevitable, and if forward motion at any point depends upon current and past decisions, it is of some priority to protect the health and vitality of economic life. There is an analogous, analogous principle, by the way, for the state in relation to war, and one could, I never really thought much about it before, but I think one could write a longer text on the relation between these principles and the state and war. But it's surely a first duty of the state, for instance, to provide for conditions of peace and to maintain a reasonable battery of defenses such that war, if incurred, would be swift and minimal. It, this is not merely a political principle, right? For the loss of capital in war, the induced scarcity has a profound economic character, and this is widely acknowledged. But more serious still, fostering robust economic life is one of the primary means by which states may provide for the conditions of peace. So these principles are not so distinct, right? Politics over here and economics over there. And they tell us something about each other. Rather, these principles are sort of same but different. As much as a matter of, as much, it is as much a matter of economic justice that markets exist and flourish as it is that war is avoided. The first principle, of course, this one I've just articulated, is primarily concerned with that first dynamism, the coming in and out of existence. And, Luckily for us, uh, we don't normally worry that markets will entirely go out of existence here. Um, but the second principle emerges from the following observation, and this is where things get a little trickier. If we're going to have a distributive theory of economic justice, and if Hayek is right that value only appears in relation to human purpose, then economic justice cannot be about the distribution of physical stuff and not even about the distribution of dollar amounts, which represent baskets of goods and so on. Rather, it must be about the distribution of value, which is a much more complicated problematic. Right? And ultimately, it's somewhat intractable, if we're honest about it. Distributing goods, um, even institutionally, as a program of justice, does little to actually equalize anybody. And the fact that free agents are free to make trades immediately after uh, as the moment of equalization passes, remember this pressing forward, in the very next moment, there is new inequality. Um, time, the passage of time means essentially, unless we restrict all free trades, that there's not a possibility of equality. Um, certainly not even in goods, but definitely not in value. So this just can't be helped. So a principle then might be articulated as follows, and I'm just, you know, we're making this up here. No one's ever done this before. No one's ever thought about the civil war in a drug justice. So we're, <laughs> this, is, this is fun though. So a second principle could be the following, that men should be enabled to participate fully in the value-seeking harvest of the market. So ordinarily, this means what, when people say this? Pe pe uh, this means a twofold participation, including work and consumption and savings. But work is the primary of the pair, since consumption and savings is a function of labor and not the reverse. So note that such a principle that people are enabled to participate in the value, like it's like you let them at it, just let them get in there, um, and that they're enabled to do that, whatever is needed to get in there. This principle includes something like Nozickian entitlement justice, right, because how, how are you enabled? Do you have to own something to go trade something? So, so it's, it presupposes something like Nozickian entitlement justice, as well as the rules-based Hayekian social justice. But this goes beyond to a, a richer conception of, of kind of enabling. The state would then be enjoined, for instance, to pursue broader cultural and social conditions for participation in social and economic life. These could be minor or they could be major. A fair assessment, for instance, of sociological data might augur in favor of particular kinds of family policies which limit, say, divorce among parents or children since single parent homes tend to inhibit participation in the market, expansion of support for private and religious schools as successfully preparing people for the market, for instance. I mean, you, could, you could survey the data and figure out what the correlations look like. And we could have a fun debate about that. Um, but you would, you would start to think about policies not being pursued under the, treat, under, uh, under the heading of equal treatment simpliciter, right? So it would be fine to pursue things under the heading of equal treatment in addition to something else, but rather with a view towards the process of something like maturation for individuals 
families. Like we think in biology that the maturation, a mature individual, member of a biological species, mature when they, when they participate in a kind of biological exchange and reproduce, right? So what would be maturation for a member of civil society in this sense, in the economic sense, would be participation, like full participation in work in the economy, meaningful work in the economy. It goes without saying that some of the policies I just described or hinted at at least, or ones we could conceive of, would limit individual freedoms in service of economic justice as a holistic conception. And so this is, in its, in its offering, something different from either libertarian or liberal notions of economic justice. There's a there there, but we're just sketching it. So this principle does hang on the notion of subjective value embedded in freedom as both the cause and the consequence of the individual engagements known as specific markets, right? Meaning the, the opportunity to go in after some value causes you to get in there, but then there's an increase in value. So it's the cause and the consequence of specific markets. And this is what the second dynamism is meant to capture and what the second principle seeks to protect. Every policy aimed at equality of outcome and even of equal opportunity in the economic sense is self-defeating under this principle. But water flows downhill. The distribution and increase of value through free exchange needs little help if participatory conditions are established, deepened, and protected. Okay, it's not a small job to get those right, but at least we have the job. Okay, a final principle then might be devised with a view to the third dynamism. Consider, consider this critique of Marx found in the epilogue to Hayek's Law, Legislation, and Liberty. This is number 13. What prevented Marx from appreciating the signal function of prices through which people are informed what they ought to do was, of course, his labor theory of value. His vain search for a physical cause of value made him regard prices as determined by labor cost, that is, by what people had done in the past, rather than as the signal telling them what they must do in the future, essentially, to be ordered to sell their products. <coughs> From this, we might note that Marxian economic justice, right, built on the labor theory of value, is based in a, okay, first of all, a strict conception of deserts, right? What is desert, which is a classical definition of justice. And it's applied to human labor already undertaken, right? So it, we, wanna, we wanna basically, um, we want to basically compensate all laborers for their sunk costs, essentially, right? Um, for lack of a better description, I'll call this backward-looking justice, right? So the difficulty that Hayek wants to point out is that if prices must be fixed always to satisfy costs already born, then some goods may go unsold, right? We say, well, this good has to have a high price because I already paid, right? But that good may go unsold because the price is too high and ultimately then unproduced, because now, right, these goods go unsold, producers become bankrupt, and goods go unproduced. Unselling is waste, and, and unproduced is scarcity. Instead, a market-based conception of prices which reflect current and future expectations of scarcity orients the markets to transactions going through. I say orients, not in every case. So the transactions happen. We maybe sell the product at a lower price. We have to adjust but at least it goes through, losses are maybe cut, minimized, tends to, so we orient the market towards minimizing waste and scarcity. We might say then that the third dynamism, which emphasizes repeated market engagement, suggests a forward-looking conception of justice. Again, this is new. I don't know what that exactly looks like, but it has something to do with this, ne this necessity of taking into account the repeated nature of economic engagements, right? So it's a forward-looking conception. Now, curiously, of course, people like Hayek um, and other market process theorists would have said that um, if we foster the rules of engagement so that forward play of the game is ensured, right? I don't go to the market and feel like I've been cheated and I never want to participate again, right? Things, are, are, things, things work out for me, so I keep, so forward play is ensured. That something like a general environment of backward-looking justice gets it takes place, right? So there's enough information spread around in the economy through relative prices that people can make reasonably um, efficient choices about where they ought to spend their time. So they put their labor in efficient ways, and the next time around, they don't feel that they can't cover their costs, right? So the idea is that you take care of forward-looking justice, and it ends up, if you get it right, taking account of this backward-looking justice. But it's not the same thing in principle at all. 
completely different thing. So a formulation of a principle might start with something like this, that economic justice favors mechanisms which ensure future market engagements or forward play of the game, and those which facilitate swift, adjust swift adjustments in relative prices based on local knowledge. Such an approach could not eliminate, eliminate all losses, but it might tend to a minimum of disruption of economic life. So where does this lead us, leave us, minimal time left? I have largely and in a schematic way disposed of equality, distribution of goods, and desserts based conceptions of economic justice in the consideration of the dynamic whole of the market. I do not deny, of course, that legal justice, which adjudicates conflicting claims of right or of property, will typically be desserts based and is very much bound up with the broader notion of economic justice captured by that first principle. I should have listed the principles in your handout too. Um, but I do insist, and so I was thinking, uh, contrasting this broad notion of economic justice I'm trying to sketch with legal, strict legal justice. I would insist that I think in the last, or maybe this is just my arrogance, I think we've had better lawyers in general, in their own right, than we've had ec economists and philosophers. And as such, I don't think we need to abandon the project of aspiring to a holistic conception of economic justice. <coughs> Intuitively, we believe that there is some sense and meaning to this, even though I just disposed of all the common definitions. All right, so I'm going to try to help us out, help me out. <laughs> so Plato, we're going to go primitive, very primitive. So Plato defines justice, of course, before equality something it's allocative in the following sense. He defines justice as the proper ordering of the three parts of the soul. The source of this idea is allocation, right? Allocation according to what? Proper place by nature, where things are supposed to be by nature. So in the Platonic view of the world, things are destined by nature for a place, as, as are the parts of the soul. So when the soul is properly ordered, we have justice. Justice then is when things are destined for a proper place, occupy that place. When it might not have done so otherwise, right? Did not need to exist, for instance, but there it does exist. And even better, not just when things are in the right place, but when they go there of their own accord, right? To, its, to their proper places. So arguably, justice as equality that we think of more naturally today is, is posterior. It comes after in order, justice, uh, justice as order, because what one means by the former, which justice as equality, is that two, per, two equal persons are destined by nature to receive the same equal shares. And justice, then, is when the destined shares, which are equal, reach those to whom they are destined. Thus, justice as order might be considered more primitive and maybe more holistic than um, justice as equality. So Plato also considered justice as the chief virtue and we do too, insofar as we use the word righteous or upright to describe all around virtue, right? Someone's righteous or upright. But that right, of course, is from use. So we, we actually sort of call people who are just all around virtuous just. It's interesting, it's like a chief virtue. Suppose then that we define economic justice as, to be, as being this, as the state in which we understand that the market as a whole including all of the specific and repeating and interdependent markets are well ordered. So they're just well ordered. That things are in their proper place. But what things? Now one answer might be, and this will get tedious, the goods, the stuff, right? But this can't be quite right. Because if it is right, then economic justice is just going to be co-identical with Nozickian justice. Why? Because as long as we believe in the inviolability of private property, and we do, uh, in other words, if everyone has title to what belongs to them, and if everybody's stuff is with them, then everything is in its proper place and everything is just. But this can't be right for another reason, which is just this. The stuff of the economy isn't the goods after all. Nothing has value outside of relation to persons. And all of that value, which was inestimable, we said, does not have a natural application to an allocation or distribution. So to figure out what things should be in their proper place, we might return to that famous Buchanan Smith proposal that economics or the market is about, the study of economics, about the propensity in human nature to truck, barter, and exchange, right? Just the propensity for us to exchange things with each other in productive exchange. And the institutions which support this activity, or as Hayek put it, 
The activity that economics sets out to explain is just not about physical phenomena, but about people. Friedrich Bastiat, this is quote 15, seems to have anticipated my question exactly. The moving parts, he says, are men, of course, men and women, that is, beings capable of learning, reflecting, reasoning, making errors, and correcting them, and consequently of making the mechanism itself better or worse. Therefore, we might want to say that economic life is well-ordered when the people are in the right place to fulfill their natural propensity to attract barter and exchange in pursuit of a better life, which is partly, not solely, but partly pursued through the abundance of the market. The lovely thing about the Buchanan-Smith proposition is that it provides exactly what Plato's notion required, a destination. What, by nature, are we destined for? Or what are, how do we decide where things go? What's their proper place? So is their destiny by nature. So under the schema, the three principles articulated above look to be plausible ways of framing a conception of economic justice as order as being well-ordered, that there is a market at all, for instance, and that states look to foster it, is surely a matter of economic justice. People simply cannot be in the right place if there is no market. I mean, in the right place with respect to that propensity. Right? And if, again, the principle of subjective value is not preserved as the heart, and the heart of these specific markets, then the propensity to truck, barter, and exchange is surely undermined. So this is so far a sketch, and an impressionistic one at that. There are many objections which could be raised. So I'm going to go ahead and raise one myself, and by way of conclusion. My objection begins by answering a question, and then by raising one. The platonic notion of justice does presuppose a governor in any ordered whole, namely the chief principle, which tells the others what their destined places are and tells them to occupy those places, right? And those of you who know Hayek's works or Kersner's works know that they like to talk about undirected order, you know, spontaneous order. Uh, and one of the difficulties with that is kind of where does all that, I mean, why do we think goodness comes out of that, right? So the natural candidate for this organizing principle is something like local knowledge, what Hayek called the knowledge of particular circumstances of time and place. And this is quote 16. It is with respect to this local knowledge that almost every individual has some advantage over all others in that he possesses unique information which, uh, of which beneficial use might be made, but of which use can only be made if the decisions depending on it are left to him, right? So this is a principle of economic freedom, actually, or are made with his active cooperation. The principle of local knowledge whereby individuals apply their own information to the economic decisions leads to the strong price signals that Hayek and Kersner and other market process theorists take to be directive, as directive as, and even more effective than, a single, a single centralized planner or governor. So Kersner tells us, for instance, it turns out, as it happens, and this is uh, maybe your last quote, second to last quote, it turns out, as it happens, that the market process approaches, approach shows that the absence of centralized direction is, in fact, necessary if the kind of coordination we've seen to be achievable through the market process is attained at all. Thus, if we look to adopt a conception of economic justice as order in the platonic sense, we are able to find an explanation of how it is that people will know where to go and what to do. We are even assured by these theorists that it is better for the principle itself, and not only to fulfill the norm of nonviolence, which is embedded in justice, that they make these choices of their own accord. So having answered that question, here's the one I should like to raise. And with this, we can move to some discussion. What gives us confidence that we're going to like the social order, which is generated by this undirected market process? The unsatisfying, really, I think, answer to this question, and the one which is advanced the most often, I think, is that our confidence should be based on the overwhelming success of the market um, in raising standards of living for the greatest numbers of souls. A related an also unsatisfying answer is that we should have confidence because there is no, econo no other economic order that looks better on the merits. So I repeat, what gives us reason to think we will like the direction of the Heraclitean river of social order that we call the market? A satisfying answer, I think, would require willingness to consider whether and if the basic laws of nature which induce men to this propensity of trucking, bartering, and exchanging 
and which also, these laws of nature, which also produce motive forces, such as self-interest and reason, whether they might be propitiously and harmoniously ordained by an almighty God, and also at the same time a willingness to believe or to take up the question of whether the salient fact about a well-ordered or just or righteous economic life is abundance or scarcity. And I, this is a question I'm merely raising. Whereby I note in closing the following two facts. First, that economic science is not so divorced from theological science as we may sometimes take it to be. And second, that the moniker dismal science seems best reserved for secular economists and those who suppose that division and aggregation make up the substance of economic thought. The rest of us, I say, we will have joy and we will have abundance. For I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Thank you. <laughs>